Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered if there's a God, and if so, what in the world he's doing in Hollywood, then do we have the Ken Commandment Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Ken Baker, E! News senior correspondent and the best-selling author of numerous books, including The Late Bloomer and a fantastic new, can't-put-it-down page burner, The Ken Commandments. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about Ken's search for God in Hollywood. That plus we'll talk about being trapped on runways, who is the peach, sunsets on Kauai, serenity pairs and college hockey, who in the world is Ken Kardashian, and what in the world does Philadelphia have to do with anything? Mm -hmm. So welcome to the show, Ken. Are you ready to shine? I am ready. I'm already shining, aren't I? You are shining bright and a mighty woohoo for having you on the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So before we dive right into things, how did your search for God begin in Las Vegas while trying to keep up with the Kardashians? That's a that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, before I embarked on this project of searching for God, I was just uh, you know another TV journalist covering Lamar Odom, who had just overdosed and was in a coma. And because I work at E and I'm familiar with a lot of the Kardashians, I was able to reach someone in the family and and was talking to them from inside the hospital. Um, I was in my hotel at the time, and they were giving me updates. He wasn't doing well, uh, and. I said, is there anything else that I can do? I was thinking, well, I'll run some water over. Do you need some sandwiches? Something like that over the hospital. And uh, this Kardashian family member who I've known for years just said, no, just please pray for Lamar. And it sort of stopped me because at that moment I realized I literally could not remember the last time I prayed, the last time I meditated where I, where I just wanted to be quiet in my thoughts. I started to realize at that moment, just how frenetic and busy and cluttered my mind, my spirit, and how uneasy uh, I felt in general, this uh, general sense of spiritual angst and existential angst. And I, and it really struck me. And, but I, you know, I, I knew Lamar, I cared about him. I wanted him to pull through. I said a little prayer and, um, of course, immediately I'm like, well, why does God care about some reality star? And why would he listen to me, this celebrity journalist guy in Vegas, like praying for some guy who just got out of a brothel because he overdosed on cocaine. Um, and then two days later, Lamar pulled out of the coma and uh, I soon was driving back to LA and was trying to talk myself out of that. I, or any prayer or anything could have any impact whatsoever on someone's, physical health. Uh, certainly, I couldn't imagine it could take to help them get out of a coma. I wasn't particularly spiritual like that. And uh, But then I started to think about it more and more on that long drive back to Los Angeles. And the more I thought about it, I realized, well, who am I to know? I don't know anything. <laughs> All these things I think I know or I thought I knew about religion and spirituality. I, mean, I was raised Catholic. I'd studied Eastern religions and had interest in that, but it sort of just drifted away. Um, I realized how little I knew. And one thing I knew was that I didn't really know God. I didn't even know what that meant. I just knew the relationship that I once had with a spiritual self was missing. And that's why I started on this project. I said, you know, I'm going to spend at least a year trying to find what I believe, uh, define it, discover it, and ultimately share it in um, what became the Ken Commandments. So that's how this whole project came about. It's, it's pretty awesome. And, and if we back up, if we look at the timeline of your life, and we don't, we don't have to go into too much detail, but if we look back, we can see some punctuation marks where it was trying to come through, and, and even in a sense, some miracles that took place in your life, if we can call it that, a miracle, but some events that took place that maybe they didn't affect you at the time, but maybe came back around now. I mean, when you say you're an open vessel, what an amazing place to be. Yeah, I am. Um, you know, when I was younger, I had had a, this benign brain tumor that was diagnosed in my 20s, had it removed uh, and got my physical health back. And uh, that was a really defining moment for me because 
it was really coming to grips with your mortality, you know, like, whoa, I have this tumor, I got to get taken out and what's going to happen. And, um, and it really gave me a second lease on life in a way, um, because it made me physically healthy. And, you know, I had some great years, you know, got married and had kids and, you know, my career really took off. Um, I was in magazines for a while and then been at E for about 10 years. And, but, you know, I, you can have, it's a cliche, but I mean, you can have all the material rewards in the world, but at the end of the day, you know, we don't get to, we don't get buried or cremated with our possessions. They go nowhere. You just have your soul yourself your beliefs um and and i think that was always on my mind and i certainly uh, you know was someone who wanted to at the stage of my life i was in i was coming up on my 20th anniversary of being a reporter in hollywood mm -hmm. and i as i reflected i realized i wanted to do something special to mark my 20 years and I didn't know what it was going to be. I've written several books, fiction and nonfiction. And I thought, well, maybe I'll write a book. I really didn't know. And uh, I reflected on it more and more. And I said, you know, what's the most important thing I could do? And I realized it was to really get my spiritual house in order. Because mm -hmm. everything else, you know, like I had a friend here at work. And she's like, Ken, on paper, you have it all. And I was like, yeah, but paper doesn't make a soul. <laughs> You know, I got to figure this out. And, um, you know, I really want to be earnest about it. And I, I think a lot of us do, right? We want to just know what we believe or don't believe. And, and you know, we're all, I think, spiritual creatures. Even if we say we don't believe in anything, we're answering a spiritual question. Um, so I, the more I thought about it, uh, you know, I kind of liken it to, I don't know if you're like me, but... I tend to lose my keys a lot. <laughs> and when I lose my keys, I always say, where was the last place I had those keys? When's the last place I can remember, right? And you go to that place. It's almost always in my house, by the way, somewhere. So I realized that, you know, when I first moved out to Hollywood in the 90s, I was working at People Magazine, I would go to church um, I, once in a while. I would pray, I would talk to God. Um, and then somewhere along the way, I just got busy and distracted and felt like, you know, my health was good and life was good and really didn't have any major crisis pressing me and drifted away. And uh, so I realized that just like I try to search for the keys where I last had them, I said, you know, I was in Hollywood and I lost them. And I lost my faith keys and I was determined to see if I could find my faith in the same place I lost it, which is Hollywood where I work every day. I'm talking to you right now from Universal Studios at the E office here. And uh, um, it was quite an experience <laughs> to say the least. Awesome. And so, you know, what's interesting to me is whether we call it God, universe, source, whatever name we want to put on it, when yeah. we do lose our faith, it tends to come back to us either what I call, and it's my mantra, kind, gentle, easy, good, because I don't want any more two-by-fours from the universe, or it comes with a two-by-four. And mm -hmm. you were starting to get some at least mild knocks beginning mm -hmm. on a Southwest Airlines flight. Well, I think that, you know, you know and we're going to get to kind of a little bit not without giving away too much of the book, you know, I'll, I'll give you some insights into where I stand spiritually now. But, um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I had struggled with panic attacks, uh, and anxiety and it seemed to be getting worse. Um, and I was on a, a Southwest flight. I was at a book convention. I had come out with a novel and, uh, was there at a booksellers convention and, it was in the middle of summer. I think it was like August in Vegas, and it was literally like 120 degrees. No, no kidding. And uh, got on the plane to get back to LA, and we it was from the second we got on the plane, it was so hot. And I tell this story in the Ten Commandments, and uh, we pull away from the gate to take off, and we go and pull off by some fence off to the side, and I mean literally, it's 
if it's 120 outside, it's like 100 inside at least. I mean, it was so hot. And I started, to, people were getting hot. We're like, when are we taking off? And they turned down the engines and we're just sitting there. And the pilot comes on and is like, oh, our tires are too hot. We can't take off. We have to wait for them to cool down. Uh, so we sit there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And I start to getting more and more panicky. Uh, I'm like, I'm going to jump out of this plane. I mean, it was really bad. And other people were like taking off their shirt and like, you know, waving their faces. And uh, I felt like so desperate that I got up and I started to walk up to the front. I was like, I'm just going to splash water in my face, you know, and the, the flight attendant's like, you know, sit down, sir. You know, you can't move, you know, da, 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 how they do that. Yeah. And I was like, no, I got to go to the bathroom. And just when that happened, you know, I'm having visions of me jumping out of the plane possibly or, you know, whatever. Uh, the pilot comes on and says, you know, oh, clear for takeoff. Uh, Ten minutes later, we take off. Cool air comes in. I'm like, I survived that. And I realized, you know, I have no tools to cope. I am fooling myself into thinking everything's okay. Um, because when everything isn't okay, and life is like that, actually, what do you have to fall back on? What is your spiritual set, core? What is your, what are your coping mechanisms? You know, I don't even have a God to pray to. I don't have a force to uh, connect with. or And, you know, and that really uh, was something before, that was long before the Lamar Odom thing. Mm -hmm. And these panic attacks would happen. I mean, I ended up having one on the air. We do a morning show called Live For Me. That's on E! Online and Facebook for E! News. And I had a panic attack and had to leave in the middle of the show. I mean, I've done hundreds, hundreds of shows. I mean, I never would have to do that. So things were getting pretty bad. And uh, I can happily report that, you know, my search for spiritual peace has been pretty successful so far. It's ongoing. The world of meditation, the practice of meditation and trying to be mindful uh, has done wonders for me. I had been on anti-anxiety medication, off that 100%. Awesome. And it's a very real, um, real story, real raw, real honest journey that I was on. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of people to thank for it. Last night I was just down in San Diego County. I was at uh, Deepak Chopra's center and was interviewing him for an e-news piece that's going to run on spirituality in Hollywood tied to the Ten Commandments and my journey. And and uh, I realized that when he taught me his form of mantra meditation called primordial sound meditation, it's like TM. Mm -hmm. um, where, where you I, get your own personal, we won't give it away here, of course, yeah, but yeah. you get your own personal mantra. Yeah, and he granted me a personal mantra and I learned from him and, and uh, you know, I realized like, wow, and I told him, I was like, you know, when I came here to learn your meditation method, I was hurting. I was lost, you know, and, uh, and I feel like I really found a sense of serenity and equanimity and peace. And uh, I'm really grateful. And so that's a big part of why I wrote the book is I really wanted to share what I learned. Beautiful. I want to talk about part of your story. You you can share what you want and say the rest. We'll we'll leave it for the book. But but it's fascinating. I look at these journeys as as collecting breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. And one breadcrumb leads to the next, leads to the next, I guess to the gingerbread house. What did Howard Stern and Adam Carolla have to do with this? Well, you know, um, there's a lot of atheists out there in Hollywood and other places. But for the purpose of my pilgrimage in Hollywood, um, you know, some outspoken people have come out and said, you know, I don't believe in God. I mean, there's no evidence of it. Um, and I felt like what I needed to do was if I was going to embark on a search for God mm -hmm. and um, as broadly defined as that is, um, that I needed to just intellectually at least start from the premise of, well, wait, I can't assume anything. And I'm going to do this almost in a scientific manner. And I'm going to at least entertain intellectually that there may not even be a God. Mm -hmm. So why am I even embarking on some search? I need to know that I think 
there might be that force out there that I still do believe in that God that I had believed in when I was younger. And so, uh, you know, I started talking to different people and getting their perspectives and, um, Howard Stern, I listened to him occasionally, not so much anymore, but, uh, you know, he's been an outspoken atheist and, um, uh, one of his buddies, who's a big podcaster, this guy, Adam Carolla, he's a comedian. I've met him several times. And he's, if you just Google Adam Carolla atheism, you hear, you just see all these rants like on YouTube and his podcast mm-hmm. and stuff where he just goes off. Oh, it's like Santa Claus religion is like fantasy. And, you know, and it's pretty compelling. I mean, he really makes a good, it's a pretty good argument. Um, so I sat with him, talked to him and I wanted to understand his side. And, uh, so about half hour in, you know, after he's explained why he's an atheist and he doesn't believe in anything, I just kind of was listening and I stopped and I said, you know, Adam, let me ask you this. Uh, everything you're saying makes sense. And, um, I don't disagree with most of it. I know there's like, it's hard to find evidence, concrete evidence of a God or, um, I get it. But do you think there's any chance whatsoever that there's a God, like even like a 1% chance. And he stops and he goes, Hmm. Nah, I, I'll give you 1%. And I said, well, so you think there is a chance that there's a God, even though it's a slim one. And Adam said, uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, Hey, I'd be a hypocrite if I'm like, these guys who are like, there's a God and this is the proof it's in the Bible a hundred percent. Cause I'd be a hypocrite if I was like a hundred percent, there's no God. I'd be the same as them, just on the other side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you sound a lot like an agnostic, not an atheist. An agnostic believes that there's a possibility there's God. Just don't have that faith in it because you haven't seen enough, but it's Mm -hmm. possible. And so he stops and he thinks and he goes, well, I guess I'm agnostic then. I'm like, (laughs) wait. I called you because you're an atheist. Awesome. I've like I've seen all of these things. So that was a really interesting part of my journey because I realized, wait, hey, I'm calling truly as a journalist trying to be, you know, unpers you know, not persuaded either way and trying to be very open minded to different things. I mean, got you know, like I tried Scientology and I had all these hang ups about it before I even went, you know, prejudging it, but I wanted to give it a shot. I've tried so many things and uh, here I was converting him to a different set of beliefs, or at least defining it differently or labeling differently. And I realized, you know, I'm definitely more, I, 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 was, a, I was not an atheist. I knew that through that conversation, and Adam helped me realize that. Awesome. So, so let's go from there. Maybe you can tell us about uh, Jason Kennedy and what you started to learn or how he directed you. Yeah, Jason Kennedy, for those of you who don't know, um, He's one of our e-hosts. He's a great guy, uh, very outspoken Christian, and he had started a Bible study uh, in, a, in Hollywood, and it was a weekly Bible study on Wednesday nights with um, this really charismatic young thirty-something pastor named Judah Smith, mm-hmm. and he started getting a celebrity following, and I knew all about it for years. And Jason would invite me, then after a while, he stopped inviting me because Ken never shows up. I'm too busy, you know, I live far away, when work's over, I don't want to stay in Beverly Hills, I want to go back home, I live like, you know, 15, 20 miles away from Hollywood, I don't want to deal. So uh, I had all the excuses to not go. And then I met Judah at Jason's wedding, and he's like, you should come to a Bible study sometime, and I said, okay, yeah, I will. And that was before I had really decided, you know, I had this Lamar Odom incident with the power of prayer and me questioning and uh, and then once the Lamar whole thing happened, I was like, you know what? I'm going to start going to that Bible study. I'm going to go. And I was nervous. I was really – like, because the last time I'd been to more of like an evangelical Bible study kind of thing was maybe in my 20s. I went to my – one of my brothers uh, was a pastor at the time, and I went to his church, and it was – very, I want to pause you for a second there because yeah. that's that's a mind blower when we get to that, to understanding that you can, you you – well, your father had said he was pretty outspoken until near the end um, about what God has to do with Santa Claus. 
Yeah. Yeah, my father was always like made fun of my oldest brother because he was uh, went to Bible stu- went to Bible college, majored in Bible, became a pastor, founded churches. Uh, I mean, like fundamentalist churches. And uh, my dad was total atheist. And then he had cancer, and on his deathbed, my brother came to pray with him, and my father accepted Jesus Christ. And my brother always was like, you know, yeah, he accepted God, he accepted Jesus. And the rest of, I've, there's four other brothers, the rest of us were always like, uh, dad was just playing the odds, you know, <laughs> just in case. He knew he was dying. So, you know, but that framed a lot of my experience. And, uh, you know, but I do, you know, I do think that, um, you know, growing up, with a brother who was very evangelical, my dad who was atheist, and my mom was very Catholic. You know, I was kind of confused. Um, but that being said, when I uh, embarked on my journey to figure out what I believe as a 40-something-year-old guy, I wanted to be open and not say, oh, man, I really had a weird experience when I'd go to the fundamentalist Christian you know, revival thing, and I didn't like it, and I didn't... But I said, you know, I got to get over it because where's this gotten me? Mm-hmm. I'm lost spiritually. I need to figure this out. So I started going to the Bible study. I was really nervous at first. I write about it the first time going and I'm like checking my phone and I'm still trying to think, how can I get out of this? But I go and it was pretty awesome. I found that the Bible, whether I accepted it as the un bridled word of God, an authentic, literal document or a morality tale, stories, metaphorical stories, whatever, whatever I believe, it was very relatable because of the pastor, Judah Smith in this case, who was interpreting the stories and relating to them to me right now. So that was a real profound moment. I was like, well, I wouldn't call myself any professed Christian. I'm not anti-Christian. I was raised Christian, but I'm actually don't look at the Bible as being as unrelatable and archaic as I used to. And that was pretty cool. That's a mind blower, actually. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I still candidly, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I would tell Judah right now, I mean, I was like, well, Judah, I, you know, whenever he's like, you know, if you want to accept Jesus Christ in your heart, um, I went to Joel Osteen as well. I went to meet him. I went to one of his revivals with a friend and met him afterwards. And, uh, you know, and I loved it. I thought it was like really uplifting and inspiring. And he's kind of a motivational preacher, uh, kind of like a Tony Robbins, but with the Bible. And, uh, and I enjoy that. And I think there's a lot of merit and value. And my general take is, you know, if, it's a if your message is about love, mm. compassion, um, being um, tolerant, and believing in you know good over evil and the benevolence of humanity. If that's what your religious philosophy is based around, I'm all for it. I don't care what you call it. So. You know, for me, I think I've gotten I'm gotten a peace of mind because I think I've come to a place where I'm I'm tolerant of different beliefs and and I've I'm enjoyed kind of being able to toggle back and forth into different things and and not feel like because I'm not all in like I can't enjoy it or get glean something from it. I wouldn't call myself a Buddhist, but, you know, every day I I meditate um, in a way that is very similar to maybe how a Buddhist would meditate. I try to live, you know, with mindful thought, (laughs) words, heart, and I'm not necessarily buying in entirely Mm -hmm. to any strain of Buddhism, but a lot of the philosophy connects with me. And I know there's a lot of people out there who might say, hmm. Well, that's real cafeteria style. 
Um, sure. <laughs> it's all love. But I'm doing it's pretty well. Yeah. You definitely, and, and I've had, well, you've done a lot of interviews. We've done a lot of interviews here. You don't strike me as, it, you strike me as having done some major rewiring or what I like to call the work. Because there's an inner yeah. calmness as I'm as I'm listening to your tenor. There's an inner calmness to you that suggests that you have been meditating, that you mm-hmm. have been looking at the words that go on, bounce around in the screen of your mind, and that you've dove deep. Yeah, um, yeah, I like to call it the work. I think um, there's a great writer, Byron Katie, I think. Mm-hmm. She has a, a really great book called The Work, I think. I could be mis- yeah, you're associated with it. Am I correct? Yeah. Am I? Okay. Yeah, and I um Yeah, I really think that um there's a tremendous power and peace that you can find when you really practice stilling your mind. And um uh, You know, I was with Deepak last night, like I said, and, you know, we were talking about meditation and and how, you know, you have all these busy thoughts, right? And meditation can kind of create space in between the thoughts. Mm -hmm. And in that space, that gap in between the fleeting is where you truly can connect with your soul, where you can it's the source of everything. It is the God space. It's where you find peace, serenity. I've had great insights in that space by stilling my mind. And it's pretty beautiful. I, it's so simple. But I think the key is that you have to practice it. You do. And I come from an athletic background. I was a hockey player. I went to college on hockey scholarship. And I know a lot about practice, you know. Like you might practice five, six, seven times before you play one game, you know, so it's, it's really about the habit. And what I found is that if I meditate daily or pretty much daily, when I need it and when I need the benefits of that, it's there. And it's more than just a psychological coping thing. I think it is tremendously and there's a beneficial, uh, there's a lot of studies that are shown that, you know, reduces stress levels and cortisol levels and, uh, can heart, help with heart disease and depression and all the anxiety stream, uh, you know, spectrum. But I also think that, and that, and it can we be a secular pursuit in that way, meditation. But also, I think that that sense of the bigger picture and connecting to the bigger force that connects you and I, that connects all of us when we just still ourselves and be present with ourselves, we're really being present with the universe and each other ultimately. So it's, so I'd like to think that by committing myself to a meditation practice, and by the way, I mean, you know, I learned this meditation mantra meditation from Deepak, but I've kind of just customized it and gone off the deep end with my own form of it. It might change day to day sometimes, but always what's present or ask, I, ask, I ask myself four questions mm-hmm. at one point in the meditation. And uh, they're called the soul questions. Who am I? Yeah. What do I want? What am I grateful for? And what is my purpose? And I've found focus and clarity by just endeavoring to answer those questions and i think if everyone does that you can make some really great insights you know and i was so inspired by it i mean i started uh an online writing academy recently called mindfulwritingcenter.com and i'm employing these kind of mindful techniques and meditation techniques to the writing process to help people share their truth with the world or maybe even with themselves to be able to write in a journal. Uh, cause I do think I believe so much in the power of sharing your story and I've been able to do that in my life with a few memoirs. And, um, uh, and so I, I've been really inspired by 
to, to the point where I've not only got my act together a little bit myself, where I feel like I can, I can share with others and, and help them on their journey. It's, it's fascinating. I know we only have a minute before we take a break here, but there's such a, a, a dichotomy here and, and it actually, it works together great of you being inside this kind of surreal world where everything moving kind of at a crazy pace and the stories are, uh, I don't even know how to describe how uh, insane, ludicrous, over the top, <laughs> under the, under the bottom. And then here's you bringing in this centeredness, this stillness mm. to it. And well, yeah, I mean, that's the challenge, right? Because we all face different um, external distractions and pressures and temptations um, that are just fleeting material carnal distractions from what really is truth, you know, in yourself. And, uh, I feel like you're always going to have something to be distracted by. It could be this <laughs> cell phone. Yeah. It could be what the Kardashians are doing today. <laughs> it could be traffic. Um, you know, and it's one thing to find a sense of equanimity and calm on a meditation pillow or a yoga mat, which I've done, but it's really hard to bring it into the moment. Um, uh, bring that mindfulness and awareness and state of um, being one. Mm -hmm. It's hard to bring that in, into the daily world. But I think if you can and you try to and you do your best, that it's, it can be a really powerful tool. You're on a very, very special path. I don't even think you, you probably do know, but this is much bigger you're going someplace special with this. That's I hope so. Right now I'm 30 floors above Los Angeles. Um, so I can't really go anywhere right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like this interview so far has kind of turned into a meditative experience. So I've got to ask, who introduced you to meditation and what was it like when you first started? Well, my experience with meditation goes back to when I didn't really know I was doing meditation. And that was, uh, as a teenager, I was a competitive hockey player. I was a goalie, I was growing up in Buffalo, New York, and I was pretty good. I was in the Olympic development program and uh, they would fly us out to the Olympic, the Olympic Training Center uh, in Colorado, uh, sometimes Lake Placid. Oh, cool, <laughs> uh, love it out there. And um, we had sports psychologists and they were teaching us how to clear our minds uh, by focusing on our breath and uh, and telling ourselves positive affirmations, kind of mantras. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize it, but I was basically doing little meditations in the middle of my competing on the ice. And so, uh, so you know, when I did realize that that's what I was doing, I started studying it a little bit because I got older and in college, but I never really practiced meditation at all. And then uh, when, as we talked about earlier, I started to have, struggle with anxiety and um, just feeling very stressed out and well, got to the point where I had a novel that I was writing and I had to get an extension on the deadline of a year because I just lost my creative ability to find the space in my brain to be creative. It was very scary for me because I, my mind had gotten so overloaded and busy. And, uh, I started to just do simple breath meditation on my own. I started to do some research. Um, and I remembered I, I worked for years. I've worked with Ryan Seacrest yeah. and, uh, I remember him talking about headspace, this app that, yeah a former Zen monk had started and, and I was like, oh, I should try that. I knew some people in Hollywood were doing it. And so, uh, downloaded it, took the 10 free classes and that turned into a daily learning, you know, what's essentially like these 10 minute meditations. It's more like this, uh, insight meditation, like mm -hmm. Vipassana, I guess you'd call it. And, uh, start really started with that. It was great. And it started to make a difference. 
and then I would say when I learned uh, and some friends, you know, uh, I talked about Brittany Daniel, an actress friend of mine who had a near death experience, and really talked about the power of meditation. She really shared some interesting insights. Also, uh, Taryn Manning, the actress, um, I met her, and she had some really insightful things to say about how she meditates and what it's done for her. And so just listening and learning from people, uh, using the internet apps, and then really learning the mantra based meditation from Deepak Chopra was the big turning point for me. Was it easy for you to sit for that 10 minutes in the beginning? <laughs> no. Um, it's so hard when you're hardwired to be bouncing around. And uh, I'm convinced that, you know, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, and ADD wasn't a thing. It was just like, shut up, go stand in the corner, stop talking, pay attention. I'm convinced I had ADD of some mm -hmm. sort back then. Um, and so I think I have a little bit of that in me. So that was a challenge. Uh, and I remember I'd sit there for like two minutes and be like, is this 10 minute meditation almost over? <laughs> and like look at my timer and be like, it's only two minutes. Like what am I going to do for the next eight minutes? You know? Cause if I stilled my mind, I'd think about all the things I have to worry about. <laughs> like, I think it's better when it's all crazy. Cause then I can't think about stuff. I just keep it busy. I was wrong. Um, so eventually, you know, I learned how to be still for 10 minutes and then 15 minutes and then, was doing 30, 45 minute meditations with Deepak Chopra. And, and my daily practice now is about 15 to 20 minutes. And th that's works for me. And if it's not at least 10 or 15 minutes, I'm like, God, that was so short. I need to do this more. I need to get more into it. So it's amazing how it's like a muscle. You can really work it out to the point where you crave it. It's like a drug almost like, oh, I want that calm. Beautiful. Let's let's switch gears for a minute. One of the things I've had the opportunity to do on this show, um, as have you, is is interview people on. Um, I think you call it the other side of Hollywood. People who are mediums and channels, and yeah. and go way down the rabbit hole. And you had just a mind blowing experience with Tyler Henry. And I wonder if you can share a little bit about who he is and what that experience was like. Yeah, Tyler Henry is a 20-year-old guy from California who uh, is uh, calls himself a psychic medium. Uh, he talks to dead people. And he has a show on E! where I work called Hollywood Medium. And he does readings on celebrities for the most part. And he usually leaves them crying, sobbing in a pool of tears because he brings up some deceased relative and he, he says he's talking to them and um it's pretty remarkable actually uh but to be honest with you i always thought oh psychics eh, it's kind of i don't know if i could go there i you know i mean i'm pretty open-minded but uh, i've never really seen it as working mm -hmm. like i just don't believe in it but because i was on this really open-minded journey i felt like well i gotta stop bringing all this prejudice to things and and give it a shot. I mean, this is my time to be open. And so I got a reading with Tyler, which I felt very fortunate. It's not easy. <laughs> I kind of pulled my E strings a little bit. Um, and I became the sobbing celebrity <laughs> that is on his show. And the reason why is because, uh, well, first of all, I was very guarded. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to give him, feed him anything. Because I wanted to make sure that he was just kind of organically coming up with, you know, these communications and these insights and these details. I didn't want to feed him. And also, I've written a lot about my life. You know, I've written memoirs and given interviews and I'm on the Internet. And, you know, I mean, I've been in the public eye for like 15 years, 20 years, whatever. So I was very guarded and defensive and he just proceeded to keep blowing me away with details about my past and about different people who died in my life. And then I said, well, you know, my dad was the closest person to me who died. Do you have anything with that? Can you talk to him? He's like, let me see. And you know, he scribbles and 
this is like his method. He kind of scribbles. And, uh, and he starts talking. And he goes, you know, yeah, your dad, you know, he's like, it's okay you weren't there. And he's talking about the three, the three sons. And I'm like, well, he has, four, he has five sons. I was like, oh, wait, but the, only three of them were there when he died. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. How would he know that? You know? Um, and so I was like, hmm, this is getting interesting. And then he goes, he's just talking, and he's kind of talking really quickly. And he, you know, Tyler Henry sweats when he's doing this. He has this autonomic response. And, uh, and he just says, like, randomly, he's like, you know, and you weren't there, but it's okay. And he feels like he had a lifetime with you, which is all true, by the way. Uh, and he goes, uh, Philadelphia, but, you know, and it, the, the Philadelphia thing is okay. And, the, da, da, da. and I was like, trying, I was taking it all in. I'm listening to him. And about 10 seconds after he keeps talking, I go back. I say, Tyler, why did you say Philadelphia? I literally did not understand why he would say that. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about the context of the day my dad died. And he said, Philadelphia. And he goes, I don't know. He goes, that's what he said. I go, who? He goes, well, I guess this would be your dad. I'm like, jeez. I start thinking, and I'm a total non-believer, by the way, but he's saying all these things over the last like 20 minutes that are just blowing me away. I was like, this sounds really legit. Not very specific details. Um, and so I said, uh, well, let me think. So when he died... Philadelphia. I said, well, I was living in Virginia and I was at work. My dad was in Buffalo, New York. My brother called and said, you got to come home. And I was like, okay. Cause he was being taken to the hospital, my dad. And I got on a plane, but I had to connect, you know, I was in Virginia and I had to connect to get to Buffalo. And I remember I got off the plane and this was in the nineties, no cell phone. And I got off and I ran to a payphone at the airport where I was connecting and I called my mom. And my mom's like, hey, Kenny, sorry, you know, your dad just died. Oh, man, you know, it's going to be there in an hour. So um, after the reading I did with Tyler, I called my mom. I said, Mom, do you remember when I called you from that airport? And you told me that dad had just died? She goes, yeah. I go, what city was I in? And she goes, Philadelphia. <laughs> I mean, you know, and honestly, like, you can believe in psychics, you can believe in paranormal, or you cannot. Um, you can believe in Christianity, you can believe in Buddhism, you can believe in meditation, Hindu, Islam, whatever. You can believe in all this stuff. Um, and you could not believe. And what I've concluded is that when something rings true to you, yeah. you know it as truth. And to this day, unless... Tyler Henry has some like inside little job with my mom where he's paying her off because she's the only one who knew I couldn't even remember. And I've never written about that particular detail. He's having some insight into my past and my history that I can't explain. Is he talking to my dead father? I don't know. I don't know, but he's definitely tapping into something on the other side, as he says. So it's pretty fascinating. Very, very cool. So if we go back to your journey, if the people who are listening to this are probably going to get inspired today and and wanting to take some steps forward on this journey, where should they begin? Well, I mean, not everyone has to come to Hollywood and search for God here. (laughs) Though it's pretty fun. fun. (laughs) Um, I think that what's important is that we all come from some sort of starting point. Uh, We were raised in a certain way, either with or without religion. And if it was with, then that is sort of framing us in some way because we're either buying into some of it or rejecting it or something. But it's definitely really impacting our subjective experience of spirituality. So we all start with that. Um, 
I think it's really essential to just stop and say, what do I believe to yourself? Not to your parents, not to your friends, not to your community. Maybe you feel pressure to think a certain way or to your spouse or whatever. Just privately, you know, like, what do I believe? Do I believe in God? What is God to me? Just start asking those questions. Um, you know, someone once told me, you know, the questions are the answers. You just keep asking the questions. Um, and I feel like that's a great place to start. You know, and as a journalist, someone who's made his living as a journalist, I mean, asking questions is part of the gig, right? And But I think the nature of inquiry and spiritual inquiry really just be, is constant questioning. Because I think a lot of people have a, this mistaken impression that it's about blind faith. Just accept. No. Seek. Seek. Um, you know, my brother, he lives in Australia now. He's, uh, he's no longer a pastor. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I've had some really good talks with him. I, I write about it in the book, my brother Kevin. And, uh, you know, when I was on this journey, he's, you know, I was like, Kevin, I don't know. I don't know if I can really buy into all the Christian stuff. There's so much baggage and I don't even know about organized religion. I know when I pray and I know when I go to Bible study, I get a lot out of it, but I'm not sure if I can buy into this little Jesus is my savior. And I don't know. And he's like, don't worry about it. Look at it like a journalist, like a story. You're doing a story. Investigate. Figure it out. Be open. And I'll say that the most important thing is to be open because if you're closed off, you can't, no light can come in. If you want light in your life, if you want light in your heart, you got to open up your doors. And so that was a big lesson that I took away from my experience of writing the Ten Commandments was just by me being open to meditation, to, hey, I thought Deepak Chopra was kind of goofy until I spent a week with him and he was transformative. Uh, I thought psychics were silly made a huge impact. I thought the Bible was irrelevant to me. I was wrong. Challenge your prejudices and be open. That, that's the advice I would give. Awesome. How has your children seen you change? Well, you know, they're in the book a lot, actually, because I spent a lot of time with them. They're 13 and 14 now. They were a little younger when I was writing the book. But, you know, one of the things I did was uh, I was on a trip with my son to Iowa, Mm-hmm. And ah, Jack Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams. And I wrote a chapter about that. And uh, we had an awesome day going to the Field of Dreams. And I asked my son, because I didn't really raise him with any spiritual, you know, foundation in an organized way, because of course I didn't know what I thought. I didn't want to force upon him anything. And my wife, you know, was always very like more agnostic, if, you know, just like, I don't know, not really of <laughs> any background. So we go to Field of Dreams, and I love that movie, the Kevin Costner movie. For those of you who haven't seen it, you know, it's a really great father-son movie in a way, and it's about his, his late father coming back to this field, cornfield in Iowa, and they, and they play baseball. The ghosts come back, and his dad is part of these ghosts that come back. Sorry, I just gave away the ending. But uh, <laughs> it's still worth watching oh my God. over and a, over again. Such a great movie. And uh, so I just happened to be like 50 miles from there with my son. So I was like, we're going. And so we went and, you know, I had never really talked to my son about what he believed. And I thought maybe he just was like a typical 12 year old boy. Like, I don't know, whatever. Actually, he was just turned 13 at the time. But uh, so, you know, we're laying there in the grass in the outfield, the field dreams, literally like in the middle of the week. It was like a Tuesday in the middle of the summer in Iowa. We're the only ones at the field of dreams, which, by the way, if you get a chance to go, it's about three or four hours west of Chicago, right there in a little corner of Iowa, kind of near Minnesota. It's beautiful. And uh, I was like, Jackson, you know, what do you believe? <laughs> anyway, I write about this in the book, and he goes off into this whole well-reasoned explanation for why he thinks organized religion are just stories that we tell ourselves to try to make sense out of the world. And he's really given this a lot of thought and I had no idea. And, um, 
and I had a similar experience with my daughter. She's, uh, we were driving the car. She's like, dad, do you believe in God? And I said, this was pretty recently. And I said, yeah, totally. Like, the Bible God or nature or Buddha. And I said, well, I think I believe in all of them. And it, her asking me that question really forced me to, because I hadn't really written the book yet, and I kind of was figuring out what I thought. I was in the middle of it. I'm still figuring out what I think. But I said, you know, there's all these languages, hundreds. We have English, Spanish, French, Italian, Swahili. But they're all different ways that humans try to communicate with each other. And I feel as though religions and organized religions and any spiritual practice, it's just a way for us to try to relate in different ways to the same God. And we're seeking the same answers. We're all seeking the same peace. Yeah, they get distorted. I think religion has been used to divide, to conquer, to subjugate. But it's also been a really positive force in the world. Like everything man has created, the phone is awesome and it also is awful. Um, but we don't throw the phones out because some of it's bad. And I think religion's the same way. And we need to keep working to make it better. Beautiful. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> So a few quick wrap-up questions we had for you. This has been awesome, by the way. This has been very... Thank you. I enjoy it. Open-hearted. That's the word I want to call it. Yeah. Open-hearted. It's the only way. I love it. So what personally brings you the greatest happiness, or what I call the woohoo factor? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, you know, I am, I'm the dorky dad guy, and I'm really proud of my kids. And, you know, my son... Uh, yeah, he works really hard, and um, he had been on a, a team, and a hockey team, and didn't go well. And then the following year, he's on a different team, and the team he went on wasn't as good as the other one. The other team was like one of the best teams in the country, mm -hmm. and he played the best game of his life. It was awesome, and I was so proud of him. I think that I have my wahoo kind of moments when – People d are able to dig deep and find parts of themselves and the potential within themselves that they didn't necessarily even realize existed. So I'm a big believer in human potential, and I really love seeing people realize it, and it makes me happy, and particularly those I love and care about. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's what really excites me. I love a great sunset. I've been very fortunate to live near the water out here in Los Angeles for many years. And I do everything I can to try to see the sunset. And I think there's something very calming about it. And just being reminded of the days and the time passing and the beauty and the moment. You have to pay attention to the sunset in the moment because it goes away so fast. Sometimes we have the illusion that everything's always going to be here. No, things move by and they go and change all the time. You need to pay attention. Um, I sound like Ferris Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> he was wise. <laughs> Life moves pretty fast. <laughs> awesome. So where can people go to find out more and to find your beautiful book, <laughs> The Ken Commandments? Yeah, uh, I'm told everywhere books are sold. So wherever that is, um, you know, I, most of my friends seem to go to Amazon. Uh, you can go down to Barnes & Noble if you can't wait. Um, anywhere you can pick up the book. Uh, you know, it's been a great experience. I'm really grateful to the people at Convergent Books, the Crown Publishing Group. And, you know, they gave me the opportunity to do this. Um, and, you know, it's not cheap to go to a week-long retreat at Deepak Chopra. And, you know, so I have the support of a publisher to help me, enable me to do some of these adventures was mm -hmm. awesome. And uh, I really hope that people are inspired and, and inspires them to go on their own journey and maybe informs the journey they're already on. And uh, I hope they have some conversations with God that are meaningful in the same way that I do in the book. Awesome. Uh, URL one more time? KenBakerNow.com. Mm -hmm. Very easy to remember. All my social media is Ken Baker Now. And if you want to uh, go on a mindful writing journey, become a mindful writer and communicator, 
you go to mindful sorry mindfulwritingcenter.com i'm adding classes all the time the first class uh, the introductory class is free i thought that it was appropriate to share with people uh, so we're going to keep adding classes to that as well Awesome, awesome, awesome. So we'll get both of those links up on the website. So if you didn't catch that, come on over to inspirenationshow.com. We'll get you over to Ken's site and over to his mindful writing site. Would you mind, before we wrap up, <laughs> leading us in a very, very short meditation of your calling? Uh, yeah, let's just close our eyes and um, just take a few deep breaths in through the nose and let a big one out through the mouth. <sighs> And again, and as you settle down through just like a gentle breath with your eyes closed, relax, just sitting there comfortably and feeling the air go in and out through your nose, just breathing naturally now. And just feeling how relaxed and calming it is just to breathe and just feel the air of the universe just passing in and out of our body and the, the miracle that's just that And right now, just maybe picture a light, a bright light. And this bright light is in the middle of your chest. And maybe it's just maybe the size of a, a fist at this point. And it's just coming right from the center of your chest, from your heart, a ray of light shining out inside of you that's just coming out that you can share warm and reaching out and that's the light inside of you and it's always there and and if you forget it just know that you can just breathe and calm yourself and and let your light shine and with all that light and warmth that you carry inside of you and carry on after this meditation, you know, we'll, we're going to move forward and we're going to just put our hands together or press our palms together in prayer and put our thumbs to our forehead and remind ourselves that we'll always just try to live in the moment and mindful, compassionate, loving, peaceful thought. Put your thumbs to your lips with your palms pressed and remind ourselves to live in the present and in the moment with mindful words. And put your palms to your chest and just to remind ourselves to always do everything with an open, loving, compassionate, mindful, loving heart. Namaste. And you can Namaste. open your eyes. Sorry, Woo-hoo. that was a little long. It was a little long, maybe. Wasn't that exactly. Was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. This I just made that up. I just made that up as we went. Well, <laughs> well, you 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 uh, made it up in an amazing, probably co-creation because you are in the zone very very well. 
Oh, and I want you to meditate on buying the Ken Commandments. Buy the Ken Commandments. <laughs> Keep saying that to yourself. I will buy the Ken Commandments. No, just kidding. <laughs> By the commandments. Command. <laughs> there, I did it for you, shamelessly, huh? <laughs> okay, good. And just keep pressing the purchase button. <laughs> the, <laughs> that's your it. mantra. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I purchased a hundred copies of the Ken Commandments. <laughs> okay, all right, good. Go with the flow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ken. This has been so, so, so much fun. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the Ken Man Commandments and maybe a hundred more, and shine bright. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>